welcome everyone to this special stream. Uh, we are joined today by Andre from, is it Andre? Andrea, hi. Andrea, sorry. <laughs> Andrea um, from the European Space Agency um, and Mike Daw from Aurora Digital. Um, so if you want to just introduce yourself and give us a little bit of information about yourself, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Andrea Comazzo. I work since 22 years at the European Space Agency. I'm flight director for interplanetary missions, and I was the flight director for the Rosetta mission. So it's kind of amazing. I'm Mike, uh, and I'm a producer at Auroc Digital. That's great. That's amazing. Uh, today, we're going to have Mike play some of the new Rosetta mission that is coming out soon. Um, as it is the anniversary of the mission. Um, it is the seventh anniversary. Um, so we're going to have um, Andrea tell us a bit about it. So Andrea, do you want to give us a little bit of a backstory of what happened? Yeah, uh, Rosetta has been one of the most fascinating space mission ever, in my opinion. Uh, you have to think that this mission was sort of conceived in the middle of the 80s. Took roughly 10 years for the European Space Agency to convince itself that it was not only worth, but also possible to fly it. In the middle of the 90s, it kicked off the development project. It took a bit more than 10 years to come to the point where we could actually launch the mission in space. It was March 2004. But it was not over. It took another 10 years to actually get to our target, which is was churyumov Kerasimenko, as a comet flying in the solar system. Right. It was a, the target we wanted to reach. So here it is in the game. I'm glad you pronounced that uh, that one. I was having I was having awful trouble <laughs> awful trouble with that. Did you have a go at pronouncing that, Liddell, before we started? I had a practice. Oh no. I I, I, I had I a little go. It. Don't put you me can on go for 67p. I'm going to call it 67p <laughs> for the rest of this stream. 67p. Um, right. 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 So here it is in the game. So in our game, um, it's not, you know, um, the time scales are different every time you play through, depending on what you research. But um, so this comet has popped up uh, in, in 1962. Don't worry about that too much. But, um, <laughs> but here it is indeed on the stream. So this is part of our new... Um, DLC and yeah indeed one of the yeah the the, the headline emission in our new DLC is indeed landing on on the uh, so which is the so we, we, we've got the Rosetta and the Philae payloads and we can land them on 67p um, so w it's, in the game it says here we're going to achieve new scientific discoveries to help us better understand the universe sounds like a good thing to do <laughs> let's plan <Yeah>. that mission <laughs> um, so here we are this is the Rosetta payloads um, let's have a look at what we've got here. So, um, pretty good short ra range comms. Um, let's select that. Do you recognize that? He's all curled up in that there. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> okay. It's actually it's amazing. Oh. oh, that's good. Yeah, he's Thinking a, about memories. Yeah, he's a bit curled up, but um, yeah, oh. he'll be all right. Okay, so I'm going to start building that payload, and uh, yeah, um, okay. Leave this to me now, and I'll have a little fiddle around <laughs> with this stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so when it was happening, what was the when everything was getting built and it was going through, and you just sent it off to the comet? How was your emotions feeling? Well, Rosetta has been like a, a going on a roller coaster because it started with a launch 10 years before, then we only reached the, the comet in 2014. So 10 years trip throughout the solar system during this trip in the solar system with any kind of uh, new operations. We even had to hibernate the spacecraft for almost three years. So for three years, we had no contact at all with the spacecraft. and. Imagine the day we regained contact, radio contact at the beginning of 2014 with the spacecraft, I think was the peak of emotions for me. Actually, that day, either we had a mission or we had no mission at all. But then in approaching the comet was a continuous improvement of the quality of the images of the comet. And this was just amazing discovering this unknown body. 
um, to the day we actually landed on the surface. Just it was a continuous emotion, and each of them was very different, actually. Oh, that sounds so amazing! Like I can imagine your heart must have been like pounding at every step when you got every bit of detail. It was, it was. I mean, I, I like playing football. And the day we, we came out of the hibernation in January 14, we hadn't heard anything from the spacecraft since June 11. Yeah. This was uh, uh, amazing for me. It was like scoring a goal in the last minutes of a game. But the game is not <laughs> yeah. over, actually. Yeah. You just scored. You are in the Champions League final. You score oh a goal. Oh my gosh, yeah. But the, the game is not over, actually. Start now. The final is still to be won. And, and oh. then it goes on for months. And then you have to defend and actually conquer any yeah. other step in the mission. We first had to detect the comet. We hadn't. Uh, we more or less knew where the comet was. Yeah. But the uncertainty on the position we had on the comet was in the order of um, 10,000 kilometers. And, you oh, know, wow. if you want to land on the comet, you have to resolve this uncertainty. So there's no chance. So the only way to do it was taking images when approaching the comet from far away and then resolving its own orbit to actually go on a collision, sort of collision course with the comet. This, that's what's tough, but at the same time, extremely challenging and rewarding. That's wild. So that is absolutely wild. And like, I can imagine how like it must have like just blew everyone's mind and just to be so to actually get there and do it all and it just to just have everything done and have it all sorted it must be amazing for you all now yeah um yeah. and to have it brought into our game <laughs> is it's gonna actually just <laughs> blow everyone's mind <laughs> it, uh, it sounds that's more challenging than the mission itself to see. <laughs> but, yeah. so i'm just about to create the, the um the vehicle to send to send our rosetta probe up i've gone for the uh, ariane 5 upper uh the ariane 6 booster and i've, I've even added four supplementaries just because i like showing yep. off um what, <laughs> what what did you use to send the the rosetta up we used an Ariane 5. Ariane 6 is not in operations yet. It's okay. the new launcher oh. we are developing. So oh, right. let's, let's see come. if I can make this look shit. Let's give, it, let's give you the Ariane 5 then for the booster. Okay. Um, did you have any supplementaries at all? Uh, Ariane 5 is on a uh, fixed configuration. You can only have two boosters. That's that's the one. That's yeah. the one. I recognize so, him th now. There are various <laughs> versions of Ariane. I don't know if you model them, but... Uh, now let's 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 yeah, let's yeah let's get this accurate to this uh, mission. Yeah. Um, Liddell, what should we name our rocket? Um, I think we should name it Cucumber. I I fully agree. <laughs> well, the real name was starting with C. It's a good guess. Okay, what, what was the real name? The real name was called Colleferro. It's a small town in Italy. <gasps> where there's the company producing the solid rocket boosters, and I used to work for that company in that town. No that way. That is amazing. No way. Is that, how do you spell it? C O L L. Yep. E F E. No, e F E. Yeah. yeah. Col yeah. Double R O. There we go. Wow. This is uh, yeah, authentic. Oh, this is a highly authentic stream, uh, folks. I know, right? Uh, <laughs> this is, are you even going to save that design? There we go. I yeah. would save it. Okay. So, um, what does your current role intake involve now? Okay. I'm, I'm responsible here at the agency in the operations directorate for the development and the execution of uh, flight operations for all interplanetary missions. So we have done Rosetta in the past. We still have Mars Express flying around Mars. We have a second Mars orbiter called ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter. And we have new missions in the pipeline. Some of them are already flying, like Bepi Colombo flying to Mercury, Solar Orbiter just launched. And then we are preparing missions to Jupiter, Mars sample return, flying oh to God. asteroids. So it's a, it's a long list of missions, and I'm coordinating all these projects, uh, in particular in the setup phase. So when we have to define the project for operations, someone else is taking care of developing the spacecraft, the vehicle, and we care of uh, preparing ourselves and the systems to fly these, uh, these fantastic missions. This is what I do. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I'm really grateful that you took time out to speak to us today. That's I'm amazing. Happy to be here, yeah. 
Yeah. So what made you want to get into your career and how did you get into your career? Well, uh, I've always been fascinated by anything flying, maybe also with, um, let's say, my father was also fascinated by technology. He had nothing to do with this job with, with this, but he was always, uh, we had some books of space, at home, aircrafts, wanted to become a military pilot. I actually joined the Italian Air Force as a cadet pilot, ah. spent there two years doing the basic training on a propeller aircraft. But then in these two years, even though I liked it that much, I realized that maybe an engineering career was fitting best my, my wishes, my aspirations. So I moved to university, completed my, my engineering degree, master's degree at Politecnico di Milano in Italy. And then I started working in Colleferro. So on, <laughs> uh, on uh, the Vega launch vehicle is a smaller version of Ariane that now is in operations. And a couple of years into, into this experience, I actually ended up working on the Rosetta project when I still was still working in Italy, on File, actually. Oh. It was 1997, so quite some time ago. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like, it's just ingrained in you, isn't it? It's indeed, like, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. yeah that, I would say it's nice. fate. I would say it's fate that you were meant to do all this. Yeah. Like how it was all there for you. Yeah. Um, so hang on a sec i'm just setting the date oh. for the, i'm just setting the date for the launch here it's been right. really it's really really picky so Is um it? yeah it looks like we've only got one month that's an optimal launch date for this the rest of the year is no good um was that accurate at all um for, for the actual mission there andrea like, the month okay we launch on the 2nd of march 2004 okay uh, this is very very variable you cannot it's not uh, month specific it depends on on the relative orbits of the planets we use to reach the comet and the comet itself right. it's a very tricky problem and you might have good launch opportunities over so many years so it doesn't mean that every march would be a good opportunity it could be that you can launch six years later and it would be in october or so right. Okay. This is very depends on the relative trajectory the orbits of the planets. So complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Long, two, three, four, second of March, two thousand and four. It's easy to remember. Two, three, four. Oh, yeah, that yeah. is a good yeah. time. Yeah. Two, right, three, four. Right. Um, okay. So, do you think video games are a good way to improve public's perception of space science and engineering? Well, uh, for sure, for sure. They first they reach a, a very wide audience. Obviously, uh, they reach a, an audience. I, I imagine that is uh, very interesting to understand what is behind the game itself. So actually, it could stimulate also also people uh, asking themselves why we are flying this kind of mission, how these kind of missions are possible. To understand like the principles of the energy transfer, which is essential for a flight like the one one of Rosetta. And then I think also video games resemble a lot part of the work we do in mission control. Once we are in the control <laughs> room executing operations, in the end we are in front of a screen and we get information from this screen. This is all what we have once we are flying. Yeah. It's not like flying a plane, an airplane, that you are sitting on the plane. You also have a physical, uh, let's say, input. Here you don't have, you just have information through a screen. And then it forces you, it, um, it's the information you have to process to make decisions. And this is also resembling a lot what we do for a portion of our work, of course. Yeah. It's not always like that. Well, we're just about to launch our our payloads. Yeah. So, oh, so, let's watch. So, yeah, fingers crossed for this. Yeah, it's always a topic moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it looks good so far. Oh, I thought I saw the engine spluttering, but now he's all right, I think. No, no, looks okay. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> okay, excellent. Phew. Okay. Okay, so now we've launched. Yeah. Okay, I've got some questions. <laughs> sure. About um, the Philae mission and how it bounced when it tried to land right <laughs> so when it la when it bounced when it tried to land um did the rosetta bounce as well 
Okay, first we landed Phile in November 2014, seven years. Right? Yeah. Then uh, uh, this was one of the payload, one of the scientific instruments Rosetta was Phile in itself. It in itself was a spacecraft carrying instrument and was one of the experiments, if you want, of Rosetta. Phile had some issues indeed when, when landing and uh, bounced on the surface of the comet because some of the systems, uh, let's say, designed to actually anchor and push down feel on the surface didn't work properly when it touched down. So this, that's the reason. Only two years later, when Rosetta mission, Rosetta has been orbiting the comet for two years after the landing of Phile. At that stage, we couldn't fly the mission anymore. And we decided to mm. conclude the mission by landing it. Uh, on Rosetta, we have no evidence of anything because as soon as we touch ground or touch uh, down on the on the surface of the comet then the transmitter switched off it's very likely that rosetta also bounced on the surface of file of, of uh, churium of Karasimenko. but for this we have no evidence uh, of course uh, because the, the radio communications were interrupted at that stage it's most likely that rosetta suffered some mechanical damage it has yeah. these huge solar panels which most likely broke because it was not designed obviously to to land but uh, some energy might be um, transferred back into the body of the of the spacecraft yeah. and this um, for sure has bounced a bit on the surface how far how long uh, this is, is difficult to judge because you would need to know better the properties of the surface in that uh, let's say position and also to see how it actually reached the surface in which angle so it's mm. very difficult to judge but it's likely yeah. that some bouncing happened. So well, that does sound. Sorry, go no, on. No, no, go on, Adele. No, you go. Uh, I was just going to say I've just um, just done the first phase of that mission. Um, so the next phase is um, it was twenty three months away. So um, it looks like we've got a long wait until uh, that probe gets to the actual um, sixty uh, seven P itself. How long did it take? Um, we, we like in real life. Oh, it took 10 years, actually, to oh, reach okay. the comet. We launched in March 2004, and we reached the comet in August 2014, a bit more than 10 yeah. years. Yeah, crazy. It's just amazing. Yeah, that's a, it's amazing, but imagine, like, imagine the time. It, I was going to say, like, imagine, like, how much it saw in that time. <laughs> And imagine if you could just collate all that data. Like, imagine if it just stuck together, which it wouldn't have done because it would have been battered by stuff in space. But um, so, uh, I'm guessing the Rosetta's still not in one piece. So, so yeah so i've just noticed yeah Sorry. so um i've just noticed yeah our entire <laughs> our entire rosetta mission in the game does take about um about 10 years so the next phase i'm on now <laughs> i'm on the mars gravity assist phase now right if, if february that... 2000, 2007 yeah you remember, remember it well, it well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. you bet you bet <laughs> actually this was one of the most critical mission phases that oh, was it by yeah, because doing a flyby at Mars is critical in itself. You have to navigate very accurate to this celestial body, which is hundreds of millions of kilometers away. But yeah. Rosetta actually flew behind the planet, so it went in eclipse. And Rosetta was designed not to have eclipses for its original mission, which was supposed to be launched in 2003. Then for problems linked to the launch vehicles was postponed. We had to select a different comet. We were supposed to fly to Comet Virtanen, <laughs> not Churium of Karasimenko. Yeah. And then when we plugged in this Mars we buy and went and noticed that we would have an eclipse. And only later, very close to the launch, we realized that there was an eclipse. So we were very, very concerned. So we had to program the spacecraft in a way that it was not designed for to go through this eclipse. So shielded by, by the planet from the sunlight. Yeah. So we had to rely on its own batteries. We were very concerned, but it did work out very well. That's a that's that's some quick planning on you guys' part and amazing skills. Um, with your amazing skills, what are you like parking a car? Oh, me personally, actually, I'm looking forward to automatic guidance uh, driving <laughs> because I'm I'm terrible. Since I was 
Till I was in Italy, it was more or less okay. But I live in Germany since a long time now, and parking lots are much larger than in Italy, so it's much easier. And when I drive back <laughs> to Italy, it's always a nightmare. So <laughs> actually, I let my wife uh, parking. <laughs> well, I can't drive. Um, I drove into the side of a bus, so don't worry, I can't drive at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Was it, um, was it moving or parked? Uh, we're not going to discuss okay. that. That's a part of the question. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've landed on a comet, what is the next thing, place in the solar system that you would like to explore? Even though you're exploring loads of places. Yeah, we, we, are already, we already have in the pipeline several missions, like, as I said, flying to Mercury, uh, actually reaching Jupiter and its icy moons to, uh, to explore. I think... Uh, we are preparing Mars sample return, so we are preparing Ooh, the mission yeah. that will go to Mars, sample soil, and then deliver them back to Earth. But I think the real next big step is actually to fly to, to the icy moon and do a sample return from, from this, because these are like mini solar system around Jupiter and, and Saturn. And uh, okay, you know, these are icy, there's a lot of water and life develops in water. I think we should definitely look at those places. I'm not sure what, what the likelihood of finding life there would be, but this is definitely the next step in, in solar system. Yeah. Where it is, it is there, definitely. Isn't, isn't the, the Jupiter icy moons probe, hasn't it got a really cool name? It's like juice or yeah. something. <laughs> It's called juice. Uh, juice. Yeah. Juice. Juice. Yeah. Yeah. This, is what, <laughs> yeah. this is what we are preparing, yeah. 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 Um, what was I doing? If, oh, yeah. <laughs> if you could um, agree, if you could find one pl planet with life on in our solar system, which planet would you like? Me personally. I don't know. I, if I were to fly in space, I would go to the moon because I, then it's still reasonable. You can see the Earth and so on. But if you were to fly, find life, I would say either the comet that looked like a mountain with a lot of snow. I love skiing. Yeah, or oh, Europa, that'd be which cool. is a, uh, yeah, or, or Europa actually, which is uh, is, a, is an icy moon of Jupiter. And then, yeah, then I think I would find myself comfortable in an icy environment. I think I would like Europa. I think I would be. Mm -hmm at home at Europa. Um, okay. So, um, in Mars Horizon, one of the things we wanted to capture is the atmosphere of excitement around launches. Uh, what was the atmosphere like in Mission Control when you landed on the comet? Well, what was amazing, I've, uh, I've seen several launches or uh, mission critical events uh, here in ESOC. I think I was not here on site when, when we actually uh, reached Mars for the first time with Mars Express in 2003. I was told it was amazing. Similar when we landed our uh, Huygens probe on the surface of Titan, one of the moons of Saturn in, back in 2005, I think. And the, the atmosphere at the landing of Phile was even beyond those. I mean, the, the center was packed with people. We had uh, huge trucks from television parked all over the place around the center, in the center itself. It was okay. just amazing. I was going around yeah. and taking pictures because nobody could <laughs> believe it. And yet television, media all over the place, everybody wanted to talk to you. So that you you really could really measure the excitement all over the place, everybody from everybody working in the center. I think this will be yeah. remembered for, forever. In mission control uh, was a mixture of excitement, tension, anxiety, and uh, I mean on one side also we were hoping to get to the end because it was extenuating also to get exhausting to to, to get to that point. So people were also tired and, and was a was a gigantic effort. And the day it came, then of course you uh, you live it once in, in a lifetime, and something like this, not twice. It's unlikely that you live it twice, and and it was just fantastic. I would I would uh, wish everybody could could go through an experience like that. Ah, oh. um, if what was I going to say? How many people were involved in the mission itself? For, I, at the beginning, or did? I yeah, was going to okay. say because yeah, it's, is a long... it's very it's very difficult to judge. You, you've heard that the mission spanned over a lifetime of yeah. thirty years from the day it was conceived oh, yeah. to, to the day we reached the comet. I would say if we consider this, for sure we're talking about thousands of, of 
people yeah. if we just focus for example in the last uh, year when when we reached the, the the comet and we did the landing i would say in our center directly and indirectly i would say at least 80 people without the, the the surrounding event then where everybody was involved yeah <laughs> and then maybe another is a center you could consider another 80 people plus we had all the inst- the, the the teams of the scientists uh, actually dealing with the scientific instruments so we easily go in the direction in my opinion of two three hundred people directly involved in the in the mission in the last in the last years uh, of course not of them full time but this is the, the numbers we're talking about but over the full lifetime we're talking about for sure thousands of people no no doubt how many people have worked in it all the way through like you have well think? okay i i actually after launch i moved on a side mission a spin-off of rosetta was called venus express so a few months after launch and i spent a, couple, a bit less than two years on venus express then i came back to rosetta just before the mars swim by <laughs> yeah but there was a, there's a colleague she has actually joined as a as a young graduate in in, in a program is as in in 2004 or end of 2003 she was there at launch and she stayed on the mission till the very end. So oh. she was in the flight control team working 100% for the project throughout. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> and she's still with us now. She's working on, on the Mars missions. That's amazing. Um, okay. So what did you personally do to celebrate when it was done and you'd meet, met all your objectives? Well, okay. For for me personally, I, I just before reaching the comet, I had moved into the role I'm actually uh, uh, covering now. So my my time dedicated to Rosetta had to fade out. So I was deeply engaged up to the Phila landing, not for the remaining let's say two years at the comet of the co- of, uh, of Rosetta. Of course, I was still responsible for it, but far less in the control room. So when we when we landed with Phila. You remember the Champions League final I was talking about? Yeah. This, yeah. W- this was the end of the game for me. Oh, the day yeah. we won the final. So that was yeah. it. And the day after, or a couple of days after, I actually feel that the, all the, the exhaustion going out. I was really like worn out. But, uh, but at the same time, uh, it was a, lo- a feeling of what do I do now? I, I think we landed, it was on a Wednesday, then for three days till the Friday evening, we were very busy. Yeah. Then I had a sort of week, relaxing, more or less relaxing weekend. It was my w- wife's birthday as well. So, <laughs> then, and when I came back to the office on Monday morning, I said, what do I do now? How can it be my professional career? There won't be anything in my life that will top what we have done on Rosetta. What do I do now? Anything will be less interesting. Yeah. It's lasted for a while, I have to admit. I think it's a psychological effect that uh, we yeah. have to go through in our job. But fortunately, of course, then um, uh, again, challenging projects came into the portfolio. You are engaged in new teams, new people, and then, then it goes on. Oh, yeah. It sounds like you just, it was just that, that whole high that you read for a while. Yeah, this yeah. is actually a, a symptom that is known to us. Actually, our key role in our job of mission control here in the, our organization is called Spacecraft Operations Manager. And we call it SOM in our language, uh, in the acronym. And yeah. actually, we say we, there's the, the post-launch depression of the SOM. So in preparing a launch, which is typical, the highlight event of a mission, you really engage dramatically. So very, very heavy workload. And then yeah. once you launch, the mission works, and then you ask yourself, what do I do now? So it's a known uh, psychological effect yeah, of facts. our job. We have, we, we, have, I, 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 we have exactly the same with game launches as well. When we, okay, when we launch imagine, a video yeah. game, we've got to get straight back in making the next one, or else we sit there going, I don't know what to do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's very similar. So we have to deal with that as well. Ah. you got to keep moving. Have... you got to keep moving, yeah. Adele. you got to keep busy. Do some yeah. star jumping. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. I feel like this. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a go. We'll do that. <laughs> okay. So, um, a main 
so I was, gonna, I, was gonna, I was gonna give you an update on how, how our filet yeah, stuff where, is where are we is where are we yeah so uh we're doing well folks uh, i have not messed up at all which is unlike me in this game because um <laughs> yes, it it, is. It's, it's 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 really it's a really complicated mission um so i've just done the second earth gravity assist um yep. uh so um so that's us now hopefully slinging ourselves across the solar system is it um we've got a mid-course maneuver coming up in three years and five months um but yeah, yeah. so far everything is on uh, in our space agency everything's going well so yeah sorry. Ah. Excellent. excellent back to the now you're fine <laughs> now you're fine um so what do you do to relax when after like the whole stress of the day what is your favorite thing to relax i don't know it's a several i would say um sort of do it yourself i like it a lot i like mountain biking i used to play football now i watch football games actually <laughs> i would love to go back to, to football and in winter skiing I, I love skiing ski touring or ski mountaineering and this is what i like most but if i have to say on a let's say weekly basis is mountain biking and, and do it yourself. I'm, I've always had a small project to, to sort out at home. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's always got a small project to do and build. My dad's like that. It's like always yeah. doing something. I'm like, stop it. I want to sleep. <laughs> 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 um, okay. So that's your sort of calm down. What thing gets you really excited? Like gets you really hyped and excited? I love uh, new projects. I'm not someone that defines the, the new project, but I'm definitely the moment uh, goals are set. For example, if you had asked me to conceive Rosetta, I would have said, forget it, it's impossible. But yeah. the no, no moment someone is so mad to think that such a mission can be flown, then I can do it. Then I yeah. can set up the project to do it. This is what <laughs> I, it gets me excited to, to actually conceive, do the mid-long-term plans to actually implement something that is very challenging. This is what, uh, and that's why I believe I also more or less ended up in this role. Now I'm looking more at, uh, a bit more detached from the day-to-day -day mission control. I'm looking more at the future projects. I'm looking how we can set up the, the organization of our team, yeah. the systems we need, the, the challenges we have to prepare for. And this is what uh, what gives me the 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 the, the strength the energy to yeah. Yeah, yeah um if you saw yourself uh when you were in like high school what advice would you give to yourself to myself well <laughs> i think something i've learned in particular when i left the air force this was a dream job for me i really wanted to do that but at a certain stage i realized that there was something not working properly and it was very hard for me to to decide to to leave the air force but i decided based on what my heart told me and yeah. well, the first thing i would say is select when you have we are in front of a very hard decision i would say select the options with your brain and make the decision with your heart so the brain the rational part should allow you to to discard options that are not realistic at all but I actually only limit to the ones that are realistic. But then the decision has to come from your heart because it's where your passion will be is and actually is what will be the fuel for you, for your engine to go on. Yeah. This is what I, I think most. And when people ask me what they should study at university, I say study the, the thing you like most. Most likely in your life, you go to university only once. Just study what you like most. It's irrelevant what it is. It, yeah. It's actually you should you should actually exploit this, and for sure your passion will lead you to, into the right way. Yeah, definitely. I am. Um, what did I do? I went to uni and I did all sciences because I love science. But then I went on to be a teacher, and I realised I hate teaching, but I love working with kids. <laughs> but then I decided actually but I love working in games more <laughs> yeah so it's see. just that passion it's just where exactly okay, where your passion lies indeed if you can afford it I am full perfectly conscious that uh, not each of us can afford it uh, life situations might not lead you be in a position to do exactly what you like then yeah fair enough 
But if we can, just aim for what you like. This yeah. is, we live only once. And yeah, if exactly. we waste our chance like that, then then it's a pity. Yeah. Well, that, that, that mid-course oh, maneuver, that mid-course maneuver went fine, by the way. Oh, that's amazing! <laughs> so, so that means, uh, like, in a little bit, I think it's about three years in game time. We'll we'll have the actual landing on the comet bit. So here we go. Oh, yeah, no, you was, uh, that that maneuver was a super challenge for us because our propulsion system didn't work properly, and we had uh, serious oh. difficulties to execute that maneuver. No way! If it was really, we were really concerned. Oh no! Right, so that's yeah. us now. We've just. Um, yeah, we've just arrived at the comet. We've swept through the tail. Uh, I don't know if you saw that that cutscene there. Now, um, did you like how much um, did you get? So you got a lot of data from being on the comet, but did you get any data through being in its tail at all? Yes, yes. There was a stage where uh, actually the scientists asked us to actually do an excursion into the tail of the comet. We were already orbiting the comet since a while. Phil had already landed, and then the, some of the instruments wanted actually to to basically go into the tail of the comet. We went up to a couple of thousand kilometers, if I recall correctly. So we were orbiting the comet down to the closest was 10 kilometers. Then we stepped back. Uh, then when the comet went closer to the sun, becomes more active. So it starts emitting more gas and more material. So it's dangerous for the spacecraft. So we had to go a couple of hundred kilometers away. But there was once we actually did one or two excursions into the tail because this also carries uh, important data that the instruments wanted to process. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. That was it was amazing mission. Actually, uh, I think it's very difficult to show what the most difficult part of, of Rosetta was. Uh, many people are fascinated by this long trajectory we spent in space, these 10 years to reach the comet. I wouldn't say that this was the easy part, but for sure it was not as difficult as doing the, the comet operations because we actually reached a body that we didn't know at all. When we fly to Mars, it's tough, but we know where we are flying. We know almost everything of Mars. The comet, we hadn't the faintest idea of the shape. We hadn't the faintest idea of the mass, therefore of the gravity. Of course, we had yeah. our estimation. Uh, the, it's difficult to maybe visualize, but when you, we fly around Mars, we have a sort of reference system for Mars. The coordinates, we know how the planet rotates. We didn't know anything of the comet. We had to invent or create everything the moment we arrive at the comet. So we arrived on the 6th of August of 2014 at the comet. Within six weeks, we were in a position to orbit the comet. And this was a super challenge. It was technically the most difficult part of the mission was that one. This was super difficult, and uh, our colleagues that have been doing the, the navigation, what we call the flight dynamics, have done a fantastic job in defining orbits where they could observe the comet, derive the data, and actually create models for the comet, such that we could plan the flight around the comet. It was just incredible. It's crazy. Well, here we go, folks. I think I am just about to get locked in around... The, uh, no, what uh -huh. did I do there? Okay, so that's the mid-course maneuver done. So yeah, we're just about to get close to landing on the comet. So we're now 12 months away from that. So there we go. Let's see what happens. Oh, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's going to take a while, so let's see. Yeah, let's let that, <laughs> let's let that roll over. See where everybody else is doing. There's, sorry, there, there's Jackson. Let's see where Jax is off to. Where are you off to, folks? Where's Jax? Uh, oh, so are they, the, yeah, they were going Mars around Mars. Yeah, they were orbiting Mars, mate. Yeah, that's what they're doing. With, um, they're just doing that. Yeah. Well, you know. Here we go. So what did you... Oh. No, no, go on. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> Okay, How so, long you got? Uh, um, so we're about to do the comet orbit thing now, Liddell. This is this is our oh, this is this, this is what the... I was just describing. Oh. So as you can see, yeah, we are super close to that comet, um, and uh, yeah, we're about to get into the the yeah the the difficult bit, <laughs> basically. So let's let's have a go. You've got this. Oh crikey, that is difficult. Okay. You've got this. So um, I've got a lot of heat to um, to contend with in 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 this particular puzzle. Did, like, did did heat come into play at all in the calculations for the success of this mission? Like, trying to get avoid getting it too hot during the design phase. Absolutely. Uh, 
the, the, there were two big challenges. Rosetta was flowing close to the uh, close to the sun and far away from the sun. So definitely, a hot case was the most difficult one because you, it's difficult to, to actually get rid of all the heat that the, uh, the electronics inside actually accumulates, and also the heat you get from the sun. We did have a couple of problems, fortunately not too serious. Uh, then uh, at the deep space phase of the mission, when it was getting cold, fortunately not, not at all. So it was one of the biggest fear in the design phase, but fortunately the design was uh, was excellent. So this was uh, was very stable, I would say, That's and reliable. Good. That is so good. What um, what would you say was your biggest worry? Like your personal biggest worry of the mission? Okay, th th there were several. I would say the highest risk I is this mission phase where we hibernated the spacecraft. We we basically hibernated in June 2011, and we woke it up from hibernation in January 2014. This was a, a huge risk, but was unavoidable. We we couldn't do any. Uh, we were flying so far away from the sun that where there was not enough energy coming from the the sun. To keep it alive or to keep it alive in a safe way so we prefer to switch off many units hibernate it and wake it up when it was coming back closer to yeah the, the other thing technically the most difficult as i said there was definitely uh, learning on how to fly around the comet Rosetta yeah. was the very first mission that landed on a celestial body having selected the landing site itself all the other missions where we landed, we had scouting mission, going there, explore the body, and decide where to land. Rosetta not. Rosetta arrived there, scout, was scouting the comet, and then decided where to land. This was a challenge. The engineering model of the comet that you need to actually design orbits around it, technically, this was a masterpiece of our colleagues here. It was fantastic to read about. So Liddell, yeah. I'm just about to complete the orbit task and get this and get our payload onto the uh, comet. Ready? ready yeah, right. I am ready for it. Let's do it. I'm go. Okay. Uh, so this is the final bit. This is the lander delivery section. Oh, it's sorry. It's got really complicated again. <laughs> so I guess oh, I guess good. this is accurate. Uh, yeah, this is a really complicated mission. So I thought this was this was the end. It's not quite the end yet. Uh, but we You've got this. Is the heat yeah. is the problem? Or, no, now it's zero. Uh, no, so what we've got with this one is that we've got this thing called drifts. Um, some some maneuvers cause the, the payload to drift, so you have to kind of keep it on a even keel. I don't know how accurate that was with your mission, but it's, uh, yeah, it's one of the... Yeah. It was one of the most difficult things because the comet is an active body, so it emits gas. Right. And this gas is impinging on the solar panels of Rosetta. And it's like wind on sail. It's like a sailing boat. You have huge solar panels ah, right. where this wind is impinging on and it's a, it creates an aerodynamic force and this is pushing the spacecraft away from the trajectory we wanted. Right. Oh, that's so it was a massive issue. Yeah. It this was a massive is issue. Yeah. Yeah, this is what you're seeing. Yeah. <laughs> Very realistic. Oh, that's cool. So actually, this is possibly <laughs> one of the most realistic missions. Right. Well, right. yeah. <laughs> Oops, so yeah, I've got a little bit of heat to shift, and then um... switch off the transmitter. It cools down. <laughs> a lot of power there. Okay. I mean, yeah, I will switch off my short-range comms. I think that was uh, that is it. Let's do a bit of that, and then with any luck, this might be it. Wow, yeah, I'm getting, um, yeah, I'm getting, getting sweaty palms. Like, God knows what it was like for you folks doing it. Doing it in, in Gosh. Uh, well, it's not so real time, actually. People believe that we fly this mission, like, we, with a joystick is far away from that, actually. <laughs> Our, uh, yeah, yeah. We actually talk about hours of, of for, for yeah. the execution of our orders. In the, in, the, in the shortest case, by around Chile landing, we were generating instructions for Rosetta to execute up to six, seven, eight hours later. In a routine around the comet, we were generating commands twice a week. So oh, wow. A, I don't know. Right. These are all pre-programmed. You, you don't fly them with a joystick. Can you imagine? Oh, I'm just moving it with a joystick. <laughs> but that planning, imagine if like you just did one number wrong. But uh, Yeah, of course. I mean, That planning was, uh, yeah. 
they, they, we have also independent teams to validate yeah. the products. Actually, what's very interesting here right, is to know that since we didn't know the shape of the comet, we had to test our system to get there, take images and reconstruct a model of the comet. And guess what? We did a test actually using an artificial shape of a pseudo asteroid from a video game. So the test oh, and validation team, which was Pepe. independent, used that, injected it into our operational system. We generated simulated images of this body and we ran them through our software that regenerated the shape of the comet, simulating we were acquiring images. And the source was uh, some, something from a video game. Oh, that's epic. Mm. Yeah. See? Games helping indeed, science, indeed. science helping games, just all epic all over. Now my nose wants to run. <laughs> <laughs> so excited. Okay. All right. this, is, this is now the last turn. Um, so all I've got to do is get that drift back to zero and keep my heat under four. And then with any luck, we should... You've got this. We, we should, yeah, we should be there. We get to see... Some of uh, our our animators' fantastic animations when we when it lands. So fingers crossed. There's just, there's just fantastic people all around. Here we go. So that's uh, that's it in orbit, dropping the little. Uh, yeah. There we go. It looks like the way it should have gone. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> we did it for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Smoopus coming out. Yeah, that's the probe. There you it's go. Already the drill working. That's good. Nice That's amazing. Uh, actually, people have, uh, we, we actually released the file from an altitude from the surface of the comet of roughly 22 kilometers. This is uh, twice the altitude, uh, actually, uh, uh, an airliner flight. And where the, uh, the comet was five kilometers big, is as big as the Mont Blanc. Wow. And file is as big as a washing machine. So fundamentally, from an airliner flying twice the altitude of an airliner, we dropped yeah. out of the window a washing machine to land on a glacier of the Mont Blanc. This is what we have done uh, at 500 million kilometers away. That puts it in the perspective. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right, right. That is right. so big. Goodness oh. me. That is amazing. Then, then we landed. Great. Ah, amazing. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the um, the Rosetta and Philae mission um, done in Mars Horizon. We've got some other cool stuff coming up in this update as well. Um, we've got a, um, a celebrity astronaut mission where either like somebody. Uh, like a really rich businessman or um, like an educator might ask if they can go up to space. So that'll be like a really um, quite a high risk reward mission. Because obviously if that goes wrong, your, your space agency's in trouble. Uh, that'll be in the next update. We've got this as well. Um, what else is in the next update? Oh yeah, and we've also added the Zurong rover. If you're if you're playing as China and you're doing a, a Mars a Mars landing, yeah, you can now uh, yeah drive around. Well, <laughs> you can select the Zurong rover as a payment uh, payload. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Um, but I think that's us done. Yeah, I think that's us done. We totally, yeah. we, t we totally uh, landed um, a probe on a yeah, with the with the guy that actually did it. Which yeah. is mission completed. Then, <laughs> yeah, mission is officially completed. Woo! Yeah, wow. great. Well, thank you, Andrea, for being here. Thank you for answering all of our amazing long-winded questions yes yeah, there's a lot <laughs> of yeah, questions thank was, you it was a yeah, pleasure a to be here questions. actually it actually brought up back memories that the, the <laughs> game is so 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 realistic that they actually i'm so glad we got to memories. name the rocket after the uh the right. place where you worked like that's yeah cool. it's cool isn't it yeah yeah that really is sweet. amazing we'll put we'll yeah. put yeah yeah that's really cool um, we'll put the name uh, in people and from the town will... and the company there will be super happy <laughs> oh my god yeah we'll link it and everything <laughs> see what we can um, do um yeah uh thank you so much for being here and uh we'll send you everything when it's done yeah learned a lot today this is great yeah thank have, you have again